Good morning, uh, fellow Googlers, and uh, hello to folks uh, watching this out on YouTube. My name is Alan Davidson. I uh, head Google's uh, Washington uh, Policy Office, and I'm delighted to be here this morning to, uh, uh, to introduce the next in our series of policy talks, and we're delighted to welcome today uh, Congressman uh, Congresswoman Zoe Lofgren, uh, who represents the 16th District of California, one of our local uh, uh, representatives. Just by way of a, a short introduction, uh, I wanted to share a story. I first met uh, Congresswoman Lofgren when I was, uh, it's probably in 1997 or 1998, I was a a freshly minted uh, civil liberties attorney, and I was uh, had the assignment to go out and try and change U.S. encryption laws. And uh, it's almost hard for us to believe now, but back in the day, we actually had rules in the United States that uh, were designed to try to keep somehow keep encryption inside the US and only allow the export of strong encryption. And we had this other goal of building back doors into all encryption technologies. And today it sounds kind of quaint, but at the time, it was a really serious problem. It was a serious problem for American civil liberties, a serious problem for industry. And I came in um, uh, with, uh, to visit the congresswoman with Bruce Schneier, who's a noted cryptographer and computer security expert. And let's just say we had been making the rounds on Capitol Hill, trying to describe or explain encryption to the average congressperson, well, let's just say it's, it was a challenge. <laughs> um, but we spent, I remember very vividly, we spent over, the congresswoman spent over an hour with us and we talked about the difference between asymmetric and symmetric keys, the difference between 40 and 128 bit symmetric key lengths, the problems with key recovery. It was like a total geek dream. And uh, afterwards, uh, Bruce Schneier and I walked out and Bruce said to me, you know, I, I really think, I think, you know, we really might be able to win this thing. And I said, well, <laughs> Bruce, Zoe Lofgren is not your average congressperson. Um, and it was true, and uh, we were delighted and very lucky to have her as, a, as somebody who really got it and really fought for changes in those rules. We, we ended up changing those rules and, uh, in 2000. And we have the world we have now where people actually can get access to strong encryption. And since then, uh, I mean, and in her time in Congress since 1995, uh, Zoe Lofgren has been at the forefront of the major issues that have affected the internet and technology companies, whether, it's, uh, uh, whether it was copyright, fighting for a balanced copyright law, working on privacy rules, innovative approaches to spam, the huge net ne neutrality fight where she was a major leader in the last Congress. She's been there with us. Um, in the 110th Congress, uh, she has been a leader on immigration issues in the House. And, um, and I'll say also we are very grateful for her work on patent reform, which is something that's been really, really important for companies like Google. So I am really delighted to, uh, to, to we're delighted to have her here today. She's going to be uh, joined on stage by uh, our own CEO, Eric Schmidt, in a fireside chat. Please join me in welcoming Eric and uh, Congressman Zoe Lofgren. You know, Zoe, Zoe has been a representative representing Silicon Valley, really, for more than 10 years. And her background as one of the smartest lawyers in the country, uh, a professor at uh, a local university, uh, and somebody who really understands the, the law and technology has served us extremely well. It is a great honor to have you here. I'm glad to be here. What I wanted to begin with is you did something rather courageous. You More endorsed, than one thing, I hope. <laughs> but something recently. You endorsed Barack Obama back when no one else had endorsed him. Well, yes, I did. And I, and I, I wouldn't and, say and that no one else had endorsed him, but I was but you were, the I, one of the first. One of the first of the traditional power structure, if you will, in Washington to support someone who is now leading in the polls as right. of today. Can you give us a little bit about why and was it, in fact, an act of courage? Well, I. I had fun doing it. Um, I knew that I favored him um, for a lot of reasons. Wouldn't it be great to have a smart president? I mean, uh, I'm looking forward to that. And As opposed to the current president? Well, uh, Is that what you were trying to I, say? I, I don't want to engage in the politics of destruction. But um, <laughs> certainly, either of the uh, remaining Democratic candidates are smart people, so I don't mean to say otherwise. But I think we're at a time in the country where we need an inspirational leader, not just a manager, somebody who can 
really move us in a very different direction from the way we've been going. At every level, the environment, civil liberties, uh, on and on, we're in the wrong direction. And I think we're at that generational moment where the next generation needs to move us forward. And I, I think that uh, Senator Obama is that inspirational figure. Now, just because I thought that didn't mean that I had to do an endorsement. Um, what really was a huge factor for me was my son and my daughter, mm. who um, favored Senator Obama and who told me, really, this is a time when you can't just sit on the, on the sidelines. There's too much at stake for the country and for the world. And so uh, I made the endorsement, hoping that it would help. I hope it did. Uh, certainly a number of other members of the House have endorsed since that time. And, um, it looks like he has a very good chance of being a yeah, well, nominee. Given where we are today, can you just, um, and I, I want to get back to policy and the yeah. of the Hill, but since everyone's very interested in it, what is your reading of the current Democratic primary process? How do you score it today uh, with the Wisconsin and, and other uh, victories for Senator Obama behind him? Well, Senator Clinton is really a very um, admirable person in many respects. And I can't think of another person who would still be standing after <laughs> losing 10 elections, I mean, 10 races in a row. So um, she's someone who uh, should never be ruled out. I certainly don't. I have tremendous respect for her as a person and as a, as a politician. Um, but I think that there is a, a momentum behind Senator Obama that could be hard to stop. And, and you're a super delegate. Yes, I am. Is that, what does that actually mean? Do you get a different pass? No. <laughs> or do you, do you get a different seat? Well, you know, it's funny because, um, no, we get the same old seats. Um, it's something that nobody really paid much attention to until this year because these, de these decisions were always made very early. Um, and it, it was never really a factor. You're there at the convention, but you're not counting vote by vote because it's all been done by the voters. And now, because of this, um, the nature of this race, uh, the superdelegates may be a factor in this. I hope not, because it should be decided by the voters, not by um, you know, people who are there by virtue of their positions as a member of the House or Senate or a governor or the like. But um, I think there's been a lot of discussion informally that we need to make sure that we enforce what the voters have done mm -hmm. and not overturn. I think people will go just so, so wild the, if we so, overturn so, the So on, cable, on the cable networks they say, well, you know, the superdelegates can vote either way and they're pledged this way. Your reading is that people will look at the will of the country and that, that well, legally we can vote whatever way we want, but I think that we would be well advised to look at what the country decided. Right. I think that people will be very massively upset, and they should be upset, if some so-called insiders overturn what voters mm -hmm. decide. That wouldn't be right. Let, let's move to, to to the areas of the Congress, and um, you are the the smartest lawyer I know oh. right, in, in, in Congress. <laughs> I don't know about and that. You're sitting in the you're sitting in in the Judiciary Committee and the other hearings that um, where some of the most sort of the roughest issues are coming through. The, the one that I wanted to ask you about was this issue about wiretaps. Right. And you have a strong, strong record on civil liberties. It's right. something that you're extremely passionate about. You must be upset with what has happened. Yes. So, uh, and, and you must be willing to do what you can as our representative to, to, to do the right thing. So take us through that. What are you going to vote for? What are you going to propose? H how are we going to get these issues resolved? Well, I, I wish I knew the answer to that. We, um, the House put together a, a pretty good bill, a bill that um, streamlines um, the wiretap procedures because there are occasions when that needs to happen. I and mean, we do, in fact, have enemies. Um, but also um, adheres to the requirements of the Constitution. And uh, that, that bill was sent over to the Senate, and they basically uh, dismantled it and sent us back a bill that uh, did not adhere to the requirements of the Constitution, in my judgment. And not only that, provided for retroactive liability relief for phone companies, uh, which I just, I, you know, if, if we say you can violate the law without penalty, you might as well say we don't have a law. Um, you, you can't have that, that scenario. So uh, the president. So basically, the, the, this law would give them immunity for illegal acts that they did 
For what reason? Why would they ha well, why would they get such an immunity? That's a very good question. Um, we we had the attorney general before uh, the judiciary committee recently, and he said several things. First, that they had no liability; they'd done nothing wrong. And secondly, that they needed relief from liability uh, for whatever wrongdoing they had done. Um, I have to be careful because I spent a considerable amount of time reading the classified documents okay. that I'm not at liberty to discuss. Sure. But I, I will say that there's a whole structure of how the law is to be administered that all the phone companies know about. And I think that it is right to expect uh, individuals and companies to abide by the law. And if they have not, then there needs to be accountability for that. And I will never vote to d eliminate accountability. Now, having said that, I expect that I will be uh, a conferee, uh, which is appointed by members of the House and Senate are appointed to see if a compromise can but be made. This is between the House and the Senate? That's correct. Okay. And it can't just be my way or the highway. I mean, I, we have to sit down and see, is there, in fact, some compromise that could be made? But there are some principles that I'm going to adhere to. And one is that the Constitution has to be adhere, adhered to. Now, we had, there's a lot of political gamesmanship on this, because the, the, the bill that I voted against that is, was the current law was going to expire. And we suggested even though I didn't vote for the bill, that we extend it for 21 days just to keep the status quo to give us time to have a conference committee. All the Republicans voted against the extension of the law that they say they're for. Um, and so we let that law expire. The underlying statute, the FISA uh, uh, statute, still exists. Uh, it is a decent framework. I, I don't think there's any emergency, although the president has tried to fearmonger to say that there is an emergency. All of the uh, the intelligence agencies are, are able to do what they need to do right now. We're going to go ahead and see if we can conference uh, our, our bill. The president said he'd veto anything that doesn't provide for retroactive liability relief. So we may be at a stalemate. And if we remain at a stalemate till we have Senator Obama, that, you know, that's mm -hmm. all right for the country, too, because we have a system that's actually working now. It could be improved, but it's adequate. Now, last year there was a big controversy over um, whether the the, the uh, executive the, the part of the executive branch that approved these things could bypass the FISA judges. Right. Um, you took a pretty strong position on that. You want to take us through your reasoning? Well, you know the the current administration appears to be uh, a group that doesn't really believe in the uni American system of government. I mean. Right. They don't trust the judicial or the legislative branch. It's only ex the executive, and that's not the system we have. I, you know, I trust the judiciary to play the role that they are supposed to play, and I also trust the Congress. We're not always uh, the best, but we play our legislative role, and, and the executive does not is not the entire U.S. government. Um, I think that uh, to have the judicial oversight that's, that FISA, the Act, requires is absolutely essential so that we are doing what we need to protect the country, but not to the detriment of the Constitution and, and the privacy rights that we hold dear. Well, again, you're in your role in, in the Congress, you've also been pushing hard for immigration reform. Yes. You were an immigration lawyer. Yes. So you, you've seen what, what really happens in the system as opposed to the theory as it's played out in the debate. Yeah. Um, we, we have an example here at Google, um, uh, well, it's obviously a successful con a company, uh, we should be able to get, in our view, the best talent in the world to come to Google. We now have employees parked in other countries waiting for this lottery that occurs roughly October 1st. It's filled very quickly. Um, the whole thing strikes me as foolish. Um, the people would be brought into the country r rather than working in another country. They'd pay taxes, create great wealth uh, you know, for the citizens, and, and it's just a good deal. Why are we not letting these people come into Google and work here? That's a very good question. Um, We've got us, ourselves a stalemate on the question of immigration in, in the United States Congress and in the country. Um, as I, I, people watch the um, talk shows, I mean, anti-immigrant fervor is, 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 is all over the United States. I think that's very unfortunate. Um, and that whole climate has affected every aspect 
of immigration, not just uh, people who are picking strawberries, but people who got their PhDs in engineering are all caught up in this kind of crazy discussion. One of the things that I is currently being discussed, and I don't know if we're going to be able to be successful at this, is at least this proposition. If you got your PhD and master's from an American university in engineering, math, science, or some other technology, why don't we let you stay here instead of making you go someplace else to compete against us? Um, that, so, so, that isn't the whole so issue. So who is opposed to your proposal, and well, what <laughs> IQ problem do they have? <laughs> we have not succeeded in getting that uh, done yet. Uh, but but there must be some political argument, because it's such a reasonable argument. I think it's reasonable. But what looks reasonable sitting in Silicon Valley okay. may not look as reasonable in the Ohio Valley. Um, so we've got a very diverse country. Um, and we've got to find the political consensus to move forward. And that's, I, I've found this to be enormously frustrating. Um, the system itself, aside from the lack of visas for people who would create wealth and opportunity in, in the United States, the system itself is very uh, poorly run. Um, I don't know, I'm, sh I'm sure well, looking out in this yet. valley, this is a typical Silicon Valley audience, a very diverse, um, like my district, probably enormous numbers of people who are Americans born someplace else um, may have run into just the nightmare bureaucracy that uh, can't, can't get anything done. They're still creating paper files, uh, which is kind of an astonishing uh, factor here in 2008. It's much harder to delete them when, <laughs> when they create That's a paper right. file. Like That's that. right. Now, Hey, do you have a broader view on what to do with the uh, the illegal immigration that is occurring in the country? Uh, I, I take it you're not in favor of building a large fence around the country. I don't uh, think that's going to work. Um, you know, 40 percent of the people who are here without their documents entered with a visa. They didn't sneak across a land border, and the the border that we are. Uh, the fence that's being built is in the southern border. I mean, the northern border is completely open. There's not any border patrol agents between Alaska and Canada, for example, mm -hmm. not a single one. Um, so it's not a rational approach. I do think that we need a system that works for everybody. Mm -hmm. The current system of people having to, to it, it's a job magnet for people who are at the lower end and at the upper end as well. Um, and to have systems that allow people to move back and forth is what we need for the dignity of people who want to come, but also uh, there is a security issue uh, involved. I mean, it's overplayed by the anti-immigrant side, but there is some element to that as well. Um, but right now, uh, if you, probably 70%, for example, of the people who are in farm workers in the United States are here without their documents. We wouldn't be eating salad. Um, were it not for those uh, individuals. Um, there ought to be a system. There currently is no system for farm workers who want to come here to, to come here legally. I mean, there's, there's no system that works that way. And so we've essentially forced this situation mm -hmm. through our laws. We ought to visit our laws and figure out what makes sense for the United States, what serves our interests, and it wouldn't be the current system. Mm -hmm. But, but the, the, the problem is to get consensus on what we need is, is very difficult. Um, I do think that if we have um, an immigrant uh, workforce in certain parts of the economy, that it is in our best interest that those immigrants are paid um, adequately and, and have uh, a respectful work environment uh, because their children are going to be the engineers down the road. I mean, that's, uh, you know, the farm worker today is the entry level. And uh, were it not for immigration, we would have the same kind of demographic problem that Japan is facing and Russia is facing. So we ought to embrace um, the, the role that immigrants uh, play, have always played in America, and continue to play to our Unfortunately, all of us are, are immigrants, uh, ancestrally anyway. When, when you think back to your service as a con congresswoman, um, I was thinking back to uh, when, when you started, you were actually on the impeachment yeah. period. And as a relatively young member of Congress, did that whole process shape your view of politics as it's played out, as you watched it in front of you? Because you were literally sitting in the, in, in the meeting room. It's interesting, because I'm one of the few 
in the, in the House that was involved both in the Nixon impeachment and the Clinton impeachment. And I, I worked for my predecessor in office, uh, Congressman Don Edwards, who was a member of the Judiciary Committee. I actually wrote the Cambodia bombing article of impeachment in, back in 1974. She says with great pride. I said, <laughs> but actually, we didn't approve that one for a reason, because Congress was complicit in that. And it did not, therefore, meet the high crime and misdemeanor uh, criteria in the Constitution for rogue actor. Um, the, the, Clinton impeachment was just a travesty. Um, having been through the Nixon impeachment where it was done pretty much the right way. I mean, it, it, it took eight or nine months. There was evidence, not just opinion. It had to do with misbehavior that went to the very core of the Constitution, not personal improprieties. It was just a vendetta against President Clinton. And it was, I mean, it was, it was appalling. And one of the things that I've thought about doing and we'll actually, we have the Library of Congress uh, or Congressional Research Service going through it now. We had several days that were closed to the public and uh, supposedly uh, for, to protect the privacy rights of individuals that are being discussed. But in fact, it was a gigantic two-day argument about the Constitution. Mm. Uh, and I would like to release the audio of, of that argument about the Constitution. And uh, just for the general benefit of historians on what was the, the vendetta that was going on at that time, um, I disapproved greatly of the president's misbehavior. I mean, I think you know, for a, a, a man that age to have a relationship with an intern, for God's sake, it's, I mean, it's embarrassing and it was wrong, but it had nothing to do with the Constitution. And, um, so it did shape my view of people who would throw the Constitution overboard for a political agenda. That's what went on. And I hope that we will never uh, have that again. And, and did you see a connection between that and then your criticism of the Bush administration? Or was it a different, different group? I'm sorry. Uh, at the time, in the Clinton administration, mm -hmm. the, uh, it was alleged that there was this right-wing conspiracy against right. uh, Mr. Clinton. Um, do you see that as a similar group as what has gone on with the Bush administration, which you've also been very critical of, mm -hmm. or is it a di different set of players and a different set of actors? Well, I think to some extent it's a different set of actors. I mean, there was uh, SCAFE and the, the, right. the sort of the well-funded right wing that sent investigators into uh, Arkansas to dig up dirt. I mean, it was a campaign to find things, uh, anything that they could use against the, uh, the Clintons. Uh, that crew is not running the show now. Um, but uh, certainly, the current administration has, it, you know, it's, it's probably the worst administration in history. I, I didn't know <coughs> that we would, would, would get there. But it's, it's full of cronies. It's incompetent. Uh, you know, people saw the Katrina response and thought, you know, gosh. But that's that's the administration. I mean, you take a look at what they've done to the Department of Justice, where they have made, in my judgment, decisions that were entirely inappropriate, um, highly politicized, crony politics. It's it's really the next president is going to have his or her hands full cleaning this mess up. So so now you're in charge. What happened in <laughs> 2006? was that the House and the Senate became majority Democratic. And in your career, you were in the minority For pretty much the whole, the whole time. 12 years. And now all of a sudden, you're in charge. So why haven't you fixed all these things that you're well, complaining we, about, we if I may? done, might? in 12 months, we've made progress. I mean, we ha I was in the minority for 12 years, and we've been in the majority for 13 months. And we have made some improvements. We haven't been able to do everything we wanted to do. But the energy bill we did was a huge improvement um, in terms of research for alternative energies. It's you know driving the the the, the semi truck towards oil and gas, and we did <laughs> uh, a U turn uh, towards alternative energy and uh, raising the cafe standards for the first time in right. decades. Uh, it's not everything we need to do, but it's a good first step. We made the, the biggest increase in higher education funding since the GI Bill. Um, cut uh, college and take, student and loans. Yes, thank college student that. loans are going to cost half as much, the interest rate half as much. So these are important things. They're not everything we want to do. But, uh, you know, what we've learned also is that um, the Senate is essentially tied. 
Uh, Joe Lieberman is their, is their majority, and uh, it is the graveyard of good ideas. Um, mm. They have tied themselves into knots. They need a supermajority to do anything now. I um, and they can't get it. So, so this it's not, not really the case that the Senate is controlled by the Democrats? Not really. Not if you right. need a two-thirds vote uh, to get cloture. And so we've had a lot of good things go uh, sent over. The House has, done, has been very active. And mm -hmm. we've passed more bills this year than in uh, it's been decades since mm -hmm. anything has happened like this. But not all of them have has Do you think that you the can president. get anything done in this election fever right now, with everyone so focused on the presidential election? Can the Congress actually continue with the reforms that you are pushing during this session? Or do you think fundamentally it's now going to wait until the next president? Well, some things are going to wait, um, but we, we, we still want to accomplish some, right. some additional things. We do want to get this FISA thing settled if we can. We put together a program for health insurance for children, and uh, it's, good, it's a good plan. Uh, the president has vetoed it twice. And we, the Senate actually, for once, got uh, together. They have uh, enough votes to override the veto. Okay. We are 13 votes short of, of two thirds in the House. We're going to try one more time to override that veto. It's a first step towards we need health care for all Americans, and we were going to start with, with kids. Uh, we thought that that would be something that would be embraced generally, and large numbers of people. Uh, do in the House, but not quite enough uh, to override the president. Well, you know, why would the president um, veto? It's, it's pretty well, nasty. He's not re running for re-election. Um, I think I, I want to ask one more question than ask our audience sure. to ask some questions. I ha I've, I've deliberately spoken with you mostly about domestic issues, but the issue that um, that is on everyone's mind is Iraq, Iran, Al-Qaeda, Afghanistan, right. so forth. Uh, what, what do you really think is going to happen? Are we going to wait until a new president and the president will just decide? Do you think the Congress will force some outcome? What's your scoring, again, of, on, of this huge controversy within the country on, on Iraq? I think it's going to wait for the next president. And we have tried over and over again to impact um, the Iraq situation to begin uh, removal from Iraq. I voted against the invasion, and in retrospect, you know, I, sometimes I go back and read the speeches I gave, <laughs> and oftentimes it makes you cringe, but this time it didn't, because everything I said, it turned out to be true. Um, and it's a mess. I mean, it's one of the worst foreign policy debacles ever. Mm -hmm. uh, and although um, the, the soldiers are serving, and we thank them for their service, they're all volunteers, um, there's no way the military can solve the problem that, that is there, as good as they are. It's, it's not the nature of the problem that we face. Um, I, I think that, the, in all likelihood, there is no great outcome. Uh, that's something Americans don't want to hear. We always think there's a positive possibility. But it, it is a mess uh, we have created. Um, I do think that when we support democratic institutions, Instead of dictators, we're on the we're on the right uh, road. If you take a look at what's uh, just happened in Pakistan, it's very interesting. As a matter of fact, my law school classmate was um, president of the Supreme Court Bar Association of Pakistan. Uh, he came and visited in the summer, uh, shortly before he was arrested, and uh, held and uh, mistreated to the point where all mm -hmm. his kidneys uh, failed. So, oh. you know, there's a problem when we support. Uh, and give money to dictators in the hopes that they'll fight Al Qaeda, and instead of that, they go and arrest the Supreme Court and the lawyers. I mean, that's not, that, we're on the wrong side of history on that. Mm -hmm. And th we're in a long uh, dispute with people who are anti modern and who, uh, in fact, do uh, wish us harm. And I don't think that we are going to be successful by aligning ourselves with, um, with dictators. Uh, very, very well said. Do we have some questions from our audience? Uh, people would like to line up. Go ahead. <laughs> very, very well said. 
Congresswoman, thanks for joining us today. Uh, I, I appreciate your uh, position on FISA. I, I agree wholeheartedly with you. Uh, my question is about standing. Yesterday, the Supreme Court ruled that the ACLU has no standing right. to sue. And the issue with the law like this is the only people who have standing are people who can't see what's been done to them because it's classified by the very people they're, they're trying to sue. So what can be done to give standing to perhaps Congress or to somebody else to see that the law actually gets enforced? Well, I think the, um, the chances of our being able to provide uh, standing in the current Congress with the current president is nil. I mean, Could uh, you explain standing? Standing is that you have a, a, a legitimate beef that, that you have actually been wronged and that you can go to court to seek a remedy. And it's, it's meant to, I mean, in the Constitution, you need cases and controversies before courts, not somebody who actually isn't a party who has not really been injured. And the idea is you want real disputes uh, before the court, not somebody who, who's not really been impacted. I don't know that I agree with the court's standing ruling, but I guess that opinion of mine doesn't matter very much. Um, I do think that that's part of this whole liability issue in FISA, because there are um, parties, at least coming up the way, who may, who may have standing even under the court's ruling. And uh, to retroactively provide complete liability relief uh, is, is a mistake. It's, it's, uh, I mean, I, in my opinion, Congress would not know today what uh, the administration had done except for the civil litigation that was engaged in. So what can be done to, in effect, give the law teeth? It doesn't really matter what laws you pass if nobody has the right to question what the government is doing. Do you think some action needs to be taken other than not providing immunity? Is there some I think you're right. A right without a remedy is no right. Um, and I, I think in the, with the next president, we're going to have to put um, some checks and balances in, into place uh, in, in the wiretap laws that I, I think uh, let me make sure I'm not saying anything I shouldn't say. I think it's been in the New York Times and other places that the um, laws were violated. I believe that that is the case. And, it, and unless you have some ability to call that to account within the judicial system, then you have, you have no, the law is worthless uh, if there's no remedy. So yes, I do. But we're not going to get it done with President Bush sitting in the Oval Office vetoing everything. It's got to be the next president. Thank you. Our next question. I have a couple questions. Sure, go ahead. Okay. So uh, since you brought up the GI Bill, I was one of the last people to be grandfathered in under the old GI Bill. I was in the Air Force. And uh, part of the reason I'm here at Google today is because I was able to take advantage of the education benefits of the GI Bill. Mm -hmm. But if I had joined like three months later, I would not have been able to afford to because of the much weaker benefits that were uh, available. Um, and I wonder, with all these guys coming back from Iraq, does it make sense to have a new revitalized GI Bill? I think it does, uh, not only for education benefits, but what we're not doing for uh, guys and gals coming back from uh, the war zone in terms of health care is really a scandal. Now, we did a huge expansion of funding for the VA. Uh, it's, it's interesting because you know, the Congress is a very partisan place, I think you've all observed. But one of my uh, colleagues on the other side of the aisle said, you know, they were, he was going to vote against the VA measure, and then he started reading it, and he said, well, I guess we should have had the prosthetics after all, uh, and ended up voting for it. But we haven't done all that we need to do in that score. The, the, the president has lowballed the requests in the budget, um, and we're going to have to really up that. I mean, the, the cost of the Iraq war is going to be in the trillions if you actually add in the cost to, to care for veterans. Not to, I mean, the education benefits is the smallest portion of it. The, the damage that's been done because we've saved lives where people would have died with the injuries before. I mean, just profound uh, injuries that are going to be lifelong uh, burdens that we must, will, we must gladly share because of the service that uh, people volunteered for. Uh, so the other thing is, is, are you familiar with the draft Lessig uh, campaign? A lot of people have uh, uh, Larry? Signed a, yes, and he's considering running for Congress because a lot of people have petitioned. So what do you think? Should Dr. Lessig run? Well, I'll give my advice directly to Larry on that. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps Professor, 
perhaps Professor Lessig should have a private meeting with you where you describe the actual real life of Congress people as opposed yeah. to the theoretical life. It's a long commute. It's a long, it's a long commute. <laughs> Go ahead. Hi. So I'm a long-term permanent resident of the United States. You talked a lot about uh, immigration issues. Um, right now, there's a bill in the House. It's HR 3997. And it's one of those nice help the military bills. But tucked on the bottom is an exit tax from the United States which will tax departing residents at 30% of their um, untaxed gains. Included in that is pension plans, 401ks, and IRAs. So as a result, people who leave this country after a, a period and go back to their home countries will find themselves without a pension plan. Hmm. Now, that means that since I don't have a lot of working years left in me, I have to consider leaving the US early so I can build a pension plan again. With the large immigrant workforce in Silicon Valley, what do you think the effect will be of that bill? on the people who work here, on the companies who employ them? I, I'm actually not familiar with the bill. And it's I don't, HR 3997. I, I don't doubt it, but I've, I've not run into it. <laughs> That's the and, only one I know, by the way. <laughs> and I, I don't know what the status is, but I don't think it's moving anywhere. It's actually been voted past both houses, and it's in Committee for Reconciliation. So huh. it's really close. Well, I wish I, I had an answer okay. for you. I'll have to check into it. OK, please do. And, okay. and you're saying that this particular bill, which I'm not familiar with either, is <laughs> primarily a military funding bill? Yes, it is. Hmm. And, it, and this is for uh, people who are residents who are? For long-term uh, long residents, residents who return to their home country, it will effectively take 30% of their pension plans. Okay. One day. Well, why don't my staff is here? They'll write it down, and, and, and I'll try and find let, out and get back to Aaron. Thank you. And, and our, and our Google, Google executives are here as well. So let's, thank you. let's review that. And obviously, obviously a bad deal for Google as Thanks. well. Thank you. Sure. This is uh, Vint Cerf. Oh, I was going to introduce myself, Eric, but thank you. Uh, <laughs> Thank you Famous very much. For, it, it's a pleasure thank to you. Uh, one is glad to be of service. Uh, first of all, thank you for uh, long service uh, in the Congress in the interests of Silicon Valley and our citizens here, uh, and also for taking the time to come and join us uh, today. I have this long list, which I will not go through because there are people behind me, but uh, be assured if we uh, run into a, a silent spot, I'll be happy to add some more. <laughs> Let me start out with um, a question uh, on this wiretap matter that uh, Eric brought up. Let's imagine for just a moment you are responsible for one of those telcos. 9-11 has happened. There is a, a wave of sentiment across the United States and outside of sympathy uh, and concern and worry about is there more coming. And you are assured by very high levels of the government that the requests that are being made to you are legal and written material is supplied to you uh, to that effect. What do you do? You know, looking backwards, the assertions are made that these various things were illegal violations of the law, and yet the highest legal authority in the land, except for the Supreme Court, is asserting uh, that these things are fall within uh, the prerogative of the executive branch. What should you do? And I, so I'm a little concerned that having been given assurances of that kind, uh, that we, when we turn around and say, well, you should have said no. You should have brought your own legal opinions to the table. Uh, and yet it's a little hard to justify that opinion given the sources of reassurance. Um, you and I both aren't allowed to go into any detail, but I served at MCI during those, that period of time. So I have some sense for what went on. Uh, so I'm having trouble reconciling that particular scenario with the view I think you expressed earlier, that, well, you shouldn't go scot-free. You broke the law. Here's what I think about that. I think that all of the uh, telecoms were familiar with the requirements of the statute. And that if the statute, uh, the, at least the uh, prima facie uh, adherence to the statute was not, was not made, that, that, that they have a responsibility to comply with the statute. They do, and to expect the government to comply. If, if the statute was complied with, I think that they have a right to rely, to rely on that. Um, I can't really get into what I saw in terms of the classified uh, information, but I just think it's not too much to ask uh, individuals and companies in the United States to, uh, who are entrusted 
with our information to comply with the law. We'll have to have a discussion in another context. Right. And we can go up to the fourth floor and of the I don't, Capitol. By the way, I'm not arguing that we shouldn't follow the law, but I do think that this is a really tough well, but then uh, one, issue. One argument, one argument that we face internally has to do with we're under, we, Google, are under lots of pressure from governments who make all sorts of statements. And we actually check their statements before we make mm -hmm. a decision because sometimes we could be being uh, manipulated. And it's very important that we, that we interpret the law as best we can because we're subject to it. And I think that's my general answer to this question. From a Google perspective, we're, we're in the same sort of hotbeds around information and so forth. And we have to be very careful. And it's not just true in the US. It's also all over the world. Understood. Uh, one imagines that they're, anyway, we'll take this offline. Um, could I ask one more yes, yes, question? Yes, this, this has to do with immigration. Uh, I served for a time at Stanford University, and some of the best students I had, some of the best research that was done, was done by people coming from outside the United States. And it's pretty understandable because they couldn't get here without being uh, extraordinarily good because they had to pass through significant filters just to get the opportunity to come here. We benefited, uh, we citizens of the United States benefited enormously from their research. Some of them stayed, some didn't, but it didn't matter. The research was still done and it was made public because that's part of the university process. Uh, some of those students were instrumental in creating the internet. Uh, I can't for a moment understand any rationale that inhibits the flow of that kind of talent uh, into the, the United States. And in fact, if you think about the rate of production of uh, scientists and engineers outside the US just due to population alone in right. India and China, we can never catch up. Because, and we don't, don't think we want to. We don't want a trillion people living in the United States because it's not supportable. But because we can't compete on numbers, we had better find another way to leverage the brilliant talents that are available outside the country. And one way to do that is to invite them to come here and enjoy the use of our universities and research facilities. I don't understand why that argument isn't persuasive. And I'm not suggesting you disagree with it. But I, I don't wonder about your it. colleagues and why they don't get it. It's, uh, I, you know, I'm never able to explain why people don't see the world the way I do. Um, <laughs> but uh, clearly, uh, we have benefited tremendously from, you know, the smartest people in the world wanting to come here, you know, go to Stanford or Harvard or MIT, and then you can't make people stay. But if they want to stay, aren't we the lucky ones, except that we don't allow them to. So uh, our current system doesn't make any sense at all to me. Okay. But, our next question. Um, going back to um, Lessig again, I, I obviously I want to press you on his, his run for Congress, but I wonder what you thought of his changecongress.org um, program in particular, um, encouraging congressmen to not accept donations from PACs. Well, you know, Larry and I have talked about this, and I, um, I don't think it really works the way Larry thinks it does. Um, and in a, in a way, I mean, I like uh, uh, the J Jackie Spear, someone I've known for, we were staffers together. Uh, she, when she worked for Leo Ryan, I worked for Don Edwards. So I'm, I'm a big fan of Jackie's, too. But um, in a way, if we had somebody like Larry in the Congress blogging about what Congress was really like, it would probably help us, because it's not as people imagine mm. uh, in most cases. Um, I do think that the role of, of money in politics is, is um, a disturbing one to people, and, and rightly so. There's a sense that you know somebody is you know you put your money in, you get your result out, and that should never happen. I mean, the 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 legislative branch ought to be serving the public interest, not not a variety of private interests. On the other hand, you have to have some money to run campaigns, um, and you know I kind of like the way uh, the the donors have come forward to Senator Obama, where you know it's just masses of people sending small contributions so that he owes everyone, not just a, a few. But it's hard to do that for um, mon more mundane political races, like races for the House. Would you make any changes to McCain-Feingold, or would you keep it pretty much the same? Well, you know, I think whatever you do, there's there's some constitutional constraints on, on what you can do. And 
right now, the court has equated money with, with speech. I'm not sure I see that in the same way they do, mm -hmm. but that's the state of the law today. And so if you constrain candidates, and, and it has been constrained in terms of fundraising, you end up with uh, really moneyed interests uh, who are completely unrestrained. For example, mm -hmm. the pharmaceutical industry spent more money for Republican House candidates than the Republican House candidates pay, wow. spent in uh, in 2004. Um, so th you know it's I don't I'm know. If, and I'm surprised we don't know that. That's an interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, it's there's no easy answer to mm. to, to this, um, but I do think to the extent that we can broaden out participation and contribution among all Americans, we're a lot better off. Thank you. Let's have our two final questions. We're okay. sort of running over, but this is pretty, Just pretty interesting. Just a quick follow-up to Vince Serv's question about FISA. Uh, my understanding is that if the telecom immunity is not granted, it doesn't automatically mean that the, the telecom companies get punished. It means that That's correct. a judge will decide what happens, and that judge may decide that, in fact, it was quite reasonable for that telecom executive to. That, that's correct. And okay. The argument on the, on the administration side, uh, to, to give them their due, is that unless there is you know, no, no, no chance for a case that uh, telecommunications companies will not ever respond. And I don't think there's a, I don't, I don't think that case has been made. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm thinking about is if, if, the, if it's a dollar amount that's of concern, you could take a look at capping damages in some way. Uh, but I think that if, you, if you're going to retroactively just eliminate the cases in their entirety, that's something that generally is bad practice for the Congress uh, to do. And I think it's bad practice in this case as well. Um, I think you have the honor of the last question. Oh, thank you. Uh, thanks for coming to talk to us, though. Um, I'm wondering if it's too early in the, in the election year to talk about tax reform. Uh, the, uh, uh, You'd since like the, them to be higher. <laughs> well, some of them, some of them, yes. But uh, the uh, uh, the things that happened uh, earlier in this decade have put the um, uh, the um, uh, conventional tax uh, system out of whack with yes. AMT requirements, yeah. with AMT system. And this, if if we ever get the economy on track to the extent where uh, where inflation starts up again, uh, that could cause uh, serious. Problems, especially for many of the many of the people right. at Google. Well, on on tax, luckily or not, I'm not on the Ways and Means Committee, so I don't <laughs> have to go through the details of this. But we're all aware that the AMT needs to be reformed. I mean, it was mm -hmm. you know whether or not it was a good idea originally to put it into place, people can argue, but it was never intended. Uh, to impact middle class people. It was intended to uh, impact only the very affluent who had made you know, creative use of every tax uh, uh, deduction possible so that at least the very wealthy would pay something. Um, and that's not what's happening because we never indexed it for inflation. So that needs to change. I will say that we finally did get a fix to the uh, ISO AMT nightmare that many people uh, ran into. It took me a long time. And, I, and I, we didn't get any sympathy from other parts of the country. But we finally <laughs> did get a fix uh, for that just uh, at the end of last year, uh, in, which I'm glad for. Um, and, but and thousands I, of people in the Bay Area. Thank you yes, a lot. Yes. Well, it was late. <laughs> I mean, a, a lot of people went through a lot yeah. of trauma. But at least we finally got it done. Um, the, you know, the, the tax code um, is a mess and does need uh, to be uh, reformed. Um, it's a massive effort because every single thing in there somebody loved and got it there for a reason. So it's a lot easier to say you're going to reform it than to do it. I mean, it's, it's a mess. But I do think that the, the tax breaks for the, the very affluent, I mean, most, more than 50% of the benefit of the Bush tax cuts for individuals went to people whose annual income is over a million dollars a year, not their assets, their income. And I'm not against that. I mean, that's the, Amer that's the American dream, but I also don't think those people were really in need of that tax benefit. And it's, it's had the Im impact of stripping uh, our ability to fund things that we need to fund, in addition to the war, which is now $10 billion a month, um, that's, that's all borrowed money. Uh, we have a $9 trillion accumulated deficit that has to be dealt with. And we can't just 
pile up the debt. It's having an adverse impact on our economy. Um, so, you know, we're going to have to pull up our socks and make sure we have a revenue stream that actually works for the country and also doesn't leave the, the most affluent off the hook. But we can't do it right now. We reversed the tax benefits to the oil companies. I mean, they're making money hand over fist. And, and we don't need to give a special benefit to the oil companies. We couldn't get that through the Senate. Uh, the House passed it, but not, not the Senate. So that's for the next president. And we've, you know, I don't know if we're going to completely reform the tax code, but we do need to do something. We also need to make the adjustments that are going to be necessary in Social Security. And I know Charlie Rangels, the chairman of the committee, is a great guy, um, realized, I mean, there's different ways to do it, and, and it's quite doable, but it needs a bipartisan consensus to I'm do it. I'm concerned about, about some of the things that Senator Obama said about uh, reforming Social Security, because uh, um, uh, in a sense, uh, increasing, increasing the cap on Social Security taxes uh, increases the uh, rate at which the government uh, borrows against the against the Social Security bonds doesn't provide a way to uh, redeem any, any of those bonds at any time in the well, future. Well, we we need to have more flow into Social Security. I, you know, as I say, you could you could increase the cap. You could you could cap it, but then reintroduce it at over two hundred thousand. I mean, there's lots of different ways to mm -hmm. do it. Um, but we do need to address it, and we also need to address the overall revenue and, and spending situation, because you're right, unless we also do that at the same time, we're not really solving the so, problem. So I think we've seen today why the Congresswoman is so effective, representing San Jose, well, the Bay Area, high tech. Um, I don't know of a person in Congress who understands high tech and the kinds of issues that that we face every day than you. It is a great honor to have you here at Google, and it's an honor to have you representing us. Well, thank you very much. I've enjoyed being here today, and uh, thank you for hiring all my constituents. They love working here. <laughs> they love well, working th here. Thank you all. Thanks a lot.